Yeah, we've got too much to say, so we're going to start early here. You know, <laughs> no waiting around, you know, like it's time to take the initiative, you know, which Iran has not done so far. Yeah. One of the biggest problems we've seen is that, like, a lot of people quickly jumped to acting like Iran was the defender of Palestine because they retaliated to an attack on them. Mm. Like, yeah, not the same. I know the U.S. set the bar low when they didn't retaliate when the Israelis, like, literally sunk one of their war vessels as oh, a yeah. show of force. Yeah. Yeah. That That's that a... doesn't mean we need to operate by that low bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the the uh the obligations of commitment, sincerity of uh, ideological alignments. Uh-huh. Well, yeah, you know, Iran will retaliate, but how much it's all it wants to do is retaliate. Is it doesn't want to actually like step in for Palestine, and that's to no surprise. Mem you know, members of the Iranian government in the 90s, I think it was 1997 this happened, uh, where they had a whole event that was like anti-Palestinian independence uh, inside, I, I think it was Tehran, but I, I might be wrong, it could be somewhere else. Um, and so like, that's the thing we got to kind of think about, they're quite opportunistic, they might be supposedly on their side like generally speaking now but it seems more like that's a geopolitical relationship they're trying to maintain with the houthis and the um i literally yeah. had their name prepared and i forgot hezbollah because hezbollah and the houthis are generally ge genuinely dedicated okay. to palestinian independence yeah, like yeah. they'll die by their sword for that um, yeah. They're really the only two groups that really have been that aren't in Palestine itself, like uh, yeah. that have been fighting to the death for Palestinian liberation. So, like, you know, uh, that's kind of one of those situations where I feel like a lot of this kind of stuff is politicking. And again, everyone's just eating it up. It, it's the, the Afal al Assad and the Bashar al Assad effect, where everyone just kind of laps up any bollocks they say because they play both sides and everyone loves the guys that play both sides. You know, white people, they love themselves a good opportunist. That's the thing I've always kind of noticed. <laughs> yeah, I expect that Iran is negotiating secretly with the United States to get some sort of a verbal commitment from the United States that the U.S. will not come and attack Iran like it attacked Libya. And then uh, Iran is going to believe them. <laughs> 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 and then they'll do some sort of minor thing, you know, to show off, you know, a new missile. And, uh, the <coughs> and that'll be about it. And then, uh, whereas, you know, what they should be doing is, you know, going into Gaza itself, you know, and pushing back the uh, Zionist military occupation of Gaza. They should be doing that and they would have international support. It would be even, you know, according to international law, you know, it's been passed. Ceasefire has been called for, you know, uh, by the Security Council. So it can be imposed by force legally. And that's what, you know, yeah. Iran should be doing there. At least, you know, in the coast, you know, using its Navy, whatever, you know, to uh, yeah. open up the sea coast uh, to uh, Gaza so that, you know, it can be coming in from that direction, even if it's not coming in from the other direction by conscious decision of... Um, Netanyahu, uh, Smotrich is the uh, big culprit uh, being focused on right now. So it's all Smotrich's fault and not Netanyahu, not Ben Gibbers, and not the other fascists. You know, but anyway, you know, like Iran can do something about it, but it hasn't yet. I'm looking forward to it doing something. I'm waiting to see what it's going to be. See, it would technically be a breach of the rules because they're not in the Security Council for what I'm going to suggest, but it would be a great show for like being more principled about the UN's supposed principles than the UN Security Council. And that's uh, invoking the Article of Intervention, an article oh, that yes. was de uh, originally designed to prevent another Nazi Germany. I wonder if there was like a mustache guy in like a place called Rossiya, uh, maybe Moscow, who maybe suggested an Article of Intervention in 1936. I don't know. But, uh -huh. you know... Uh, <laughs> Actually, the uh, USSR did try to intervene to stop, you know, to bring down the Nazi regime. They offered to come in and do the job, and yeah, they like, asked for permission from Poland to, to uh, you know, to uh, what the passage, you know, to go through its territory in order to get to uh, the German state Czechoslovak, and take down yeah. the government there. Yeah, and of course, Poland turned turned it down, you know, because they didn't want to let you know Russian troops onto the Polish soil, you know, 
as if they're going to stay there forever. <laughs> the offer was to protect Czechoslovakia originally uh, yeah. when the, with the Polish one, but the actual offer I'm on about is, uh, so in 1936, Stalin uh-huh. drafted a message to the British, the French, and the Americans. Uh, yes. The French said no. Uh, the Americans never answered, and then the British uh, said yes in 1943. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were already like working with each other at this point. It's like Britain literally just found like a stack of papers and went, "Oh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. I we found this here. Yeah, sure, we'll intervene against it." <laughs> yeah. Well, there's there's more to the uh, the history than that, you know, because there was the the ambassador, the Soviet ambassador to Great Britain at the time, was this Jewish guy who offered, you know, the, the deal to Britain and uh, he couldn't get it. You know, Britain wouldn't go along, you know, with it. You know, they wouldn't sort of, you know, like uh, form a United Front or to, you know, bring down the Nazi regime. Even the Nazi regime was threatening Britain. Okay, the so British they didn't, you know, so like the British the... brought it on themselves. And then, of course, Molotov came along and said, you know, well, the alternative is to make a deal with you know, the Nazis if the Britain won't make a deal with the USSR. <laughs> the Nazis were willing to make a deal. <laughs> Not that either of them. I, you know, I can look... see the point of making a ceasefire just to try and prepare for like struggle and all that. But signing a deal to section yeah. off Poland rather than like making a deal with Poland, telling them that they have, you know, like be fucking scummy about like any sit rep you got from like speaking to Ribbentrop. Go mm. to the Polish before you've even mm. signed Ribbentrop's deal yeah. and speak to them about yeah. the fact that the Germans were going to invade and figure something out about forming an alliance that yeah. just concedes the fact that Germany is going to take land, signs a deal that set cons- uh, conserves the other bit of land, mm-hmm. and then they can try and evacuate people, other stuff like that, get people into that Soviet-protected side, and that mm-hmm. would have been a much better process. I know hindsight is fucking 2020, but like the... Th- that's the big problem is the Soviet Union were a bit reckless when it came to other people's territory. Like the Lithuania situation, mm-hmm. there was already a revolution going on. Why do you need to invade? Mm-hmm. Just send them mm-hmm. guns. Mm-hmm. Just fucking help them struggle and let the mm-hmm. people fucking free themselves. Like mm-hmm. literally in the same decade that they were slamming Trotsky for the same fucking bullshit, they go and do Trotsky's like m- uh, perversion of permanent revolution where like he thinks it means let's go invade all the other countries. Yeah. Red army. Well, the difference being, you know, because if they gave guns, you know, to the Lithuanians, you know, they'd be making their own revolution, they'd have their own power. They wanted the Communist Party to take the power, not the Lithuanians. No, 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 that's what I mean. I'm not about the Communist Party. I, the Communist Party was already in a revolution. Uh, they were in, Literally, they were there was no the reason for them to invade. They could have just let the Communist Party do what they were doing. Like they, they, okay. they would have likely so it must won. Have been too independent of the Communist Party to be allowed to, you know, to take the revolution in their own hands. I'm pretty sure they were going to join the Soviet Union. I literally, I do not have any idea why they do it. Maybe the uh, communists themselves asked for it in there, which would just be like hilariously stupid if yes. that was what they asked for. Because this is why um, Lithuania and Latvia really hated the Soviet Union. Estonia is a weird misnomer. There was hatred for it, but there was a lot of love for it. But then Estonia was like the computer capital of the Soviet Union. So it was a little less mistreated than the other two. Although yeah. also kind of mistreated at the same time because you didn't want to work mm. in the computer fabs. You wanted to be working on the computers, not in those fabs. Oh, God. Yeah. But in the Polish case, you know, the Polish government at the time, you know, was so nationalistic that they ended up, you know, cutting their own throats and cutting the throat of Poland, you know, that's what nationalism yeah. leads to. It needs to, leads to defeat, not to any sort of, you know, renaissance. So, yeah. But Lenin made a point about that and the distinction between, like, what a national liberation struggle is and, like, just yeah. outright nationalism Nationalism's and the different right, levels. Right on. Right because right national on. liberation is, is a form of nationalism in a sense, but it is not, like, anchored to that bourgeois nationalism it's, yeah. and, yeah, that, like, an you know, it's it, it tries, it's, yeah. It's an out well, it's an outgrowth from nationalism. And like, you know, nationalism itself isn't necessarily an ideology. It's driven by different ideologies. And this is like what people would typically call like left-wing nationalism, um, is national liberation struggle. Because yes, Lenin tries to but... sort of like ensure people don't get so attached to the term nationalism that they mm-hmm. fall into the petty bourgeois trap of, of, yeah, of patriotism. The front, you know, of a multi uh, multi-class government, yeah. Instead of you know getting rid of the uh, the uh, the class that was collaborating against the independence of the country in the first place, 
But there's like this whole thing with Dimitrov where he just pretends like the petty bourgeoisie just innocently waltzed into fascism. Like they, they, uh, you know, they were tricked by the bourgeoisie, even though the bourgeoisie took inspiration from the petty bourgeoisie when it came to fascism. Like, yeah, mm. the bourgeoisie were like leading the show, like no shit, but like they, they took hints from them. And there are definitely forms of fascism where the lines are very weirdly murky. Like uh, mutualism is one of those weird ones. And then, uh, uh, what's it? The Soviet revisionist era, where like I mean, those the new bourgeoisie, which formed out of the 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 proletariat and the remnants of the petty bourgeoisie, kind of mixing and merging with old bourgeoisie as well. But they were kind of relegated to being used for factory administration. Khrushchev kind of slotted in uh, members of the old bourgeois class and. To like factory administration positions or people of close relation to them or people that were in the business bureau that were like closely associated with the jobs that were originally given to former capitalists um and mm -hmm. so like uh this formation this new bourgeoisie is very different to like what we would see from the traditional bourgeoisie i mean mm -hmm. they're still the same class don't get me wrong mm -hmm. but they are like kind of a mixture of being petty bourgeois bourgeois like they're the big bourgeoisie of the system because the the only thing that's above them is the state but the mm. state kind of does the big bourgeois property on and stuff and then it's the responsibilities of it are dividended between these new bourgeois and mm. so like it's based on a hierarchy system mm. on relation to how petty bourgeois minded a member of parliament would be you know like the the premiership those motherfuckers are going to be a lot more bourgeois than the lower end so you have this very complex system of like complete reaction petty bourgeois socialism turning into bourgeois socialism and mm -hmm. the confined of like how that is capitalism and the weird way they're organizing capitalism which technically speaking would be more efficient if capitalism didn't love this little thing called bureaucracy and didn't just make a mess of everything because it loves bureaucracy and loves neglecting things and loves profiting, even if it is a state system. And so like they shot themselves in their own foot because turns out you can't just make capitalism work better. <laughs> mm. <laughs> we'll tell you to fuck off. <laughs> so it reminds me of the, um, the class structure within the communist party of uh, China. And it's the old tradition of the um, Mandarin rule, which, uh, was the aristocracy that uh, opened up the gates uh, to uh, the the civil service uh, by 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 way of uh, merit and not by way of uh, uh, fam familial uh, uh, heritage? So it was a more rational system, but nonetheless, you know, very structured and hierarchical. Um, I have a story to tell you about uh, the Soviet Union. I don't know if you if you were if you heard my story about my father, what happened to him when he was a refugee in the Soviet Union. Oh, you yeah, know about yeah. that? How he was in prison for six months? Yeah. Yeah. But for yeah, six months in, in prison for missing a day of work. Yeah. That's he how was, you know. he, he entered the Soviet Union at a time when shit was starting to get bad, especially like fucking after, like anti Semitism was already starting to get on the rise. But like after Stalin died, that was when shit hit the fan. Like uh, Khrushchev was a massive anti-Semite. Like he went on, he called uh, the the Jewish uh, Ashkenazim that were returning home. Mind you, most of the Jewish people, not all of them, of course, there were definitely German Jews and other people that were also going into like the Soviet Union. Most of them used to be there or were Polish, which is like the neighbors. They're, they're the, the, you know, the Slavic Jewish peoples. Yeah. So like, and, and he called them like a, a horde or a, or a plague. And uh, like an invasion, basically. And it's like, yeah. what, what? They're coming home and they've got a right to come here. It's the Soviet Union, the Bastille of the Revolution, is it not? Like, yeah. you should be an open door to any person of, of, of refugee status and you shouldn't be a bigot mm. to no fucking ethnic group. Khrushchev mm. was levels of a piece of shit, but the revisionism, the seeds were set before the war anyway, mm. and uh, they were growing throughout the war. And so, the late forties were already getting really bad. And then like what, 1954, 400 years of unity with Ukraine. I'm sure Ukraine loved that phraseology of the 200 odd years of slavery or 300 years of slavery they went through. Yeah. Well, you know, like Semitism, you know, like has a long tradition, even in second international, I'm reading a study about that. The uh, socialist response to anti-Semitism in the uh, Imperial German state 
uh, a work uh, written by uh, Lars Fischer, published by Cambridge University Press. It's incredible, really incredible, you know, like the depth of ignorance, you know, even by the Jewish, you know, social democrats like Mehring, Kautsky, Bernstein, you know, all of them, you know, they were sort of, you know, there's a weird interpretation of Marxist, you know, pamphlet, Zara Judenfrage, and they sort of twisted it into this, you know, rationale for populist anti-Semitism. And what my father was subjected to, you know, like was a weird form of anti-Semitism because it was a, a Jewish communist, you know, the head of the so-called Union or Soviet that had him arrested in the first place. And then he was uh, liberated by a judge, you know, who wasn't Jewish, you know, so, you know, even though anti-Semitism was illegal in the Soviet Union at the time. So, you know, it was, it's, you know, like a big mishmash, you know, that was going on there. You know, there was no clarity of thought. You know, everything was just, you know, like very sort of, you know, perhaps haphazard. You know, there was no sort of, you know, like culture, you know, no socialist culture, you know, in which people knew what socialism was. It was just, you know, the like being Stalin, made up. Stalin yeah. did attempt a cultural revolution, but it was sabotaged by like social chauvinism. Uh, it's mm. something that, like, um, he doesn't get to, but, like, one of his criticisms of economics would definitely also cross over into my, one of my criticisms of the failures of the Cultural Revolution would be the fact that a lot of the economic sabotage can be tied to people who have Russian aristocratic or former Russian uh, petty bourgeois or bourgeois heritage. Mm. And uh -huh. so he saw, saw, saw a direct lineage of like people in the party that had like, they weren't just percolations of the petty bourgeoisie. A lot of them were just outright petty bourgeois. A lot of people mm -hmm. think Khrushchev come from poor background, but his father was a businessman in Ukraine. So I don't know uh -huh. about that, Chief. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, um, yeah, Stalin, I who, think, has he's the one, one of my. Khrushchev is the one who added the Donbass onto the Ukraine. When the Ukraine was yeah, there. that was because of Stalin as well. They kind of both have a price to pay for that because what happened was Stalin removed the Tatar people. Yeah. Now that leaves Russo Ukrainians, which are Ukrainians. Um. So mm -hmm. then, like, it kind of just ended up being an easy grab for a social chauvinist like like Khrushchev to give Ukraine that chunk uh -huh. of land that mm -hmm. was really a a multicultural state of like Tatar or also Ukraini, Ukrainian and like um, a lot of other different like um, uh, what's it uh, Caucasian peoples uh, oh and Turks mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, oh and Greek people would be there as well too because it's like a multicultural uh, cesspit Donbass is it's absolutely beautiful place I've always wanted to go see the Donbass River um mm -hmm. I, I don't don't the the British call it Donetsk. I think they made up their own little like Russian word for it. Well, that's the name of the city there. Maybe that's where it comes from. Maybe because like, uh, they they call the river that they do. Uh huh. But the the Russian and the local uh, Donetsk uh, uh, Donbass militias, you know, are advancing now since th throughout the whole year of two thousand twenty four. They've been advancing taking on uh, the Ukrainian forces one village after another and just, you know, like uh, uh, clearing off the area and all the way to the Don uh, to Danube River, I think they're going to be going. So that's why there's this adventure, you know, of uh, attacking into the Kursk region in, uh, in the Russian Federation itself to the north uh, by some Ukrainian forces which can't attack anywhere else. But that's going to be, that's uh, pretty well over. So there's going to be a big change there. You know, this is uh, going to give an impetus, you know, to uh, the uh, processes of change, you know, in various ways, including the revolutionary international process that's underway. Then there is Gaza. There has to be, you know, the Zionist forces have to be pushed back from Gaza. They've made it into a zero-sum game. You know, there's no other way, you know, to deal with them. They're not willing to compromise and by negotiations, they're not willing to back off in any way. And they're maintaining their ultimate program of annihilation. Okay, so then they're putting at stake, you know, they're gambling, you know, this their state, you know, in exchange for the annihilation of the Palestinian people, because if they can get away with it in Gaza, they're going to be doing it in the West Bank as well, where it's already started, you know, where there's already, you know, more than 500 uh, who have been killed in the West Bank since October the 7th in various clashes including, you know, with local militias, in addition to the general set of murders that take place. So, 
know, there is possibility for for a breakdown and breakthrough happening here. And uh, one can't be sure, you know, which or what is going to be happening. But something is going to be happening. See what Iran is going to do. It's got this new precedent, right? And he was supposed to have been, you know, like, supposedly, according to Al Jazeera, you know, more moderate, you know, than Raisi. But no, doesn't turn out to be the case. So we're going to see what he's going to be made of. And if there is, you know, revolutionary, international revolutionary potential coming out of the Iranian revolution, there's the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, but they're only sort of in the neighboring countries, which ensure the geopolitical interests of Iran, not of the world revolution as a whole, against capitalism or against imperialism. I don't think they're willing to go that far because they assume they're going to be destroyed. So they're not willing to bet their own safety and economy on the process of, you know, of another country, you know, which don't concern them directly. So I don't see what they're going to do, you know, that's going to be anything big, you know, when it concerns the attack that uh, they under, underwent in uh, Tehran when Hania was assassinated, even though that's, you know, the ultimate, you know, that's, uh, you know, it can't get any sort of, you know, more illegal than that. Hmm. Yeah, no, um, I will say what I said about the Donetsk and Donbass. Yeah, complete misconception. That's silly. But that's growing up in England. You live off misconceptions. The situation in Gaza mm. is like a, such a fucking like dreadful situation right now. Like I can't like this. The fact that the struggle is not as intense in a lot of parts of the Imperial Corps right now for Palestine than it was months ago in a lot of places, you know, turnout is lower, frequency of events are lower. And then I've got like messages from Free Palestine Birmingham where they're like, we're not going to try and arrange any counter protests against the, the rioters um, because of public safety. It's like, so so we're just going to let them win. Hmm. Really? Is, is that wow. what all this struggle was for? We just give up. Hmm. We just stop. Hmm. This is BLM all over a fucking game. The struggle mm. ain't even over. It's just got worse. Mm. Like, shit's ramping up. They're suggesting it might be somewhere over 189,000 people dead. That's yeah. a lot steeper than 40,000. Yes. Or 50 or 60. Yeah, that's 40, that's a lot of fucking... A, it's just a lower, lower uh, minimum uh, number of people that, that have been confirmed as such, you know, by hospitals, by inspection. And then there's uh, for any one person, you know, that was, uh, uh, you know, taken to the hospital, you know, there's two more, you know, that are buried underneath there. Yeah. Well, not even just that as well. Think about the fact that they go around mutilating people beyond recognition. That's the thing yes, that they've been the doing in just, a lot you know, of uh, places. Torn apart by bombs in the school, you know, just yesterday. Yeah. I mean, the soldiers as well. Like the moment they start going into villages, then they're killing people. They're chopping arms off. They're burning people to send. Uh, they're trying to make sure people can't be recognized. Yeah, there was a truckload of eighty uh, corpses that were brought to Gaza from from the Zionist military the other day, and uh, they couldn't recognize the bodies. They were too uh, too damaged and too decomposed. Yeah. Oh my! But. Uh... But there's some indication that the public opinion amongst the Jewish Israelis is shifting. There's uh, up to 70% that are considered to be in favor of a ceasefire, an end to the war, you know, with the return of the hostages without any other conditions. So the population has uh, has broken from the government, but the government is still solid. And Smotrich is even getting stronger. So the uh, Hasidic parties, they seem to be staying in the coalition. They're not going to be bringing it down because they're so dependent upon their um, subsidies, it would seem, that they're willing to sacrifice their youth, you know, to go into the military. But of the two, 300 uh, uh, that were convoked, you know, for ins conscription the other day, only 30 showed up to actually go into the military. So the individuals, you know, like are resisting, even though their leadership is not. So there's going to be a split in the Hasidic leadership uh, in which they're going to, the Zionists, you know, well, the, the Zionists, the syncopists, you know, 
we think that Zionism is just a donkey that they can ride, you know, to the uh, to the subsidies that they enjoy. Uh, they're going to lose the uh, leadership of the Hasidic community. And the Hasidic community is going to turn against them, and they're not going to have the votes, you know, next time. It's going to be a, a big shift, you know, because the uh, Mer Sharim Hasidim, you know, who who demonstrate, you know, with Palestinian flags against the military, you know, when they come into their neighborhoods, they're going to become the vanguard of the of the Jewish Hasidim there. And uh, they're going to break the back of Zionism in that way. Then the other sort of, you know, column of Zionism, besides the Ashkenazim, is the Mizrahim, you know, the Arab Jewish population, the second working class there, that are treated to an apartheid system that's internal, you know, to the Jewish Israelis. It's a double apartheid system, which I mentioned once, you know, on a Zionist radio station mm -hmm. that cut me off right away. So, you know, there's that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then they apologize for letting me talk in the first place, you know, to their real listeners. <laughs> so, you know, that's going to break through, you know, like if nothing is happening in that respect, you know, those uh, Mazahim, you know, they let themselves be treated like slaves. You know, they've got to wake up sooner or later. And then when they realize, you know, that all that they've been engaged in doing and the sacrifice for has not worked, you know, perhaps they're going to rethink their position. So I'm uh, looking forward to that. I think happening like well. a lot already will have because like i've seen the fucking streets they they're forced to live in uh i used to know someone who was trans and half mizrahim uh who lived in a pretty mean part of israel yeah. and uh i can tell you israel no not an lgbtq friendly country and it's full of shit when it says yeah. that it is you know that'd be like saying saudi arabia is an lgbtq friendly country yeah. Talking about a country that's like incredibly Judeo Christian and really strict about it. It's like being in like um it's like being in like a really, really aggressively strict Christian state. Like that's like what living in Israel is like. It, mm -hmm. it, it's like if you'd let the British monarchy do whatever the fuck they'd actually want to do with Britain. <laughs> Hmm. Everyone have to pay penance to them every morning and fucking yeah. worship them, or they'll they'll lose their head or something. The fucking that's the way they act when they go to fucking Jamaica. You see the fucking like whole situation with Will and his missus, Prince uh, Prince uh, Prince Will. He went over to uh, Jamaica and got the black people to carry him on a plinth. Oh yes. Oh well. Yeah, like cars have existed for a long time, buddy. There are plenty of them in Jamaica. Just fucking get in a car. I mean, mm. even the Queen, when she was traveling like through uh, Africa, went around on a Land Rover. Like, you know, uh, you, when mm. you make the Nazi Queen the reasonable sounding person, you yeah. were like fucked. Then again, they came out of fucking the weird fucking mess of a, a scrotal sack that you would call fucking Prince Charlemagne or, or mm. King Charlemagne the third. Um yes. well the right honorable the right honorable wanker. He's not for long, is he? Doesn't he oh, have, he's got uh, the chunky fingers of someone who's got a lot of cancer coming their way. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's uh, supposed to have uh prostate cancer or something like that. Yeah. Because, uh, he eats uh, the proper way in, and, and the proper way has nothing to do with any health. So he's going to suffer the consequences. Okay, I imagine. In any case, so he gets. Oh some my! Oh my! Yeah, but... he's the, the king of uh, Canada and the king of Quebec. But if he ever tried to come here to Quebec, I'm warning him: don't come. Don't. Don't even try. Oh, I pay to watch that. Uh, he should go visit like um fucking like Donny Gall or summer or Derry. I think that's a place he should go <laughs> visit. Like, you know, I I'm sure he'll have a good old time. Like, we we're really inviting. We have a tendency to give Englishmen free cars. You know, it's this whole yeah. like promo deal that we've been doing. You know, you gotta go to www.freecar.com slash ira and you can get yourself a free car now. Only applies to Englishmen. <laughs> start your oh. uh, you start your new car with a bang. 
<laughs> oh well, at least he. We'll get like a. You know what the old rope any, is. He's not going to we'll get, get like any old... Irishman to carry him around in a in a basket or anything, though. <laughs> oh God, he fucking he'd be the kind of guy that would like try and make a potato joke to like a local Irishman, thinking it was like so rad and funny, or he'd go top of the morning to you to someone and then get punched. Um, yes, yes. He even does this aristocratic, you know, stretch eye uh, motion. You know, when he disagrees with something or tries to ridicule something, I don't know. He does this thing. He grabs the corner of his eye and he pulls down on it as if this is a signal. You know, that aristocrats use to indicate that they're they're uh, uh, not agreeable, but they don't have any reason to give. You know, for being disagreeable, something like that. <laughs> I've seen him do that. Yeah, That's incredible. it's a way of like needing to show that you disagree, but like avoiding the disagreement because your position is controversial. He's yes. a perennialist. Have you ever heard of perennialism? No. Have you ever heard of René Guénon? Oh, no. A very French-sounding name, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's a... René, René Guénon's a transcendentalist. So one of those, like, gruelly New Ageists from the 1800s. And he, uh, one of his leading inspirations is, um, well, King Charles, but also uh, Julia Civola, the Italian fascist who got away with his war crimes for being, quote, a super fascist, end quote. That is what he said. That is how he got uh, marked as innocent in, in a house of the law. Wow. Oh, well. It sounds like that something sounds a kid simple. would say. Yeah. Like, I, mommy, I'm a super fascist. <laughs> Not just a fascist. Like, when you, like, even ultra fascist, even though it sounds slightly more cringe, sounds slightly more grown up, think a little harder. Come on. Like, um, or he could have gone the submissive role and said he was a sub fascist. You know, it doesn't hurt to admit you're a bottom sometimes. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, him and Mussolini got along quite well. You never know. They don't take themselves seriously, you know. They think they can get away with it, you know. They think they can say whatever they want, you know. And then, well, he and ends up living okay, until the seventies, you know? like be surprised. Be, big surprise coming, yeah. Well, it's it. This the, is why there needs to be people struggle against these things because, like, the ICJ are never going to truly deal with this problem. Like, the UN has been going on about going into Israel to do like ethics inspections for ages. Yeah. You know what they <laughs> haven't done got into Israel and done those ethics inspections. Yeah. So like they, these people are fannies because the U S has so much control over these institutions. You don't want to piss off the masters. Mm -hmm. That's the way this, you know, capitalism still institutes the slave mentality. So it's yeah, kind of USA agency, like, you know, like they offer money to anybody, you know, as long as you uh, follow the line and then you're supposed to know what the line is, you know, uh, by yourself. Well, so they'll just, uh, they'll just but, get uh, the people who run the show to withdraw money from you as well if you go for your principles. Yes. Yeah, exactly what happened in Palestine. So all those salaries suddenly disappeared and all those organizations collapsed, you know, because they weren't anything to begin with. But uh, the latest that I saw in Al Jazeera was, you know, an anti-racist uh, demonstration that was so big that the racists, you know, like didn't show up, <laughs> you know, like there are a few st stag staggered around, you know, like as if they were drunk, you know, like being protected by the police. And that was it. You know, that's <laughs> no show. Okay. That's the police that. is such little shit. So they're going on about how then they got a zero tolerance policy, but then uh -huh. obvious rioters came out and they didn't arrest them. Yeah. Yeah. Like, zero tolerance. They're at least you know, the... suspects. You would think you would fucking like, at least want to take them in for interrogation. This is a fascist, uh, like uprising. They're, they're really good at walking backwards. You know, when the racist, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> confront them, they just walk backwards. You know, that's all they do. <laughs> you know, it's incredible. I mean, to be honest, like I can imagine a police officer just being there and going, Terry, <laughs> I thought you were on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> to see that colleagues. Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's like in Palestine. I was there one time, you know, and I was being arrested and the soldiers, you know, they meet up with the settlers and they get hugs, you know, and then the women come down and bring them, you know, like coffee and ice cream and, you know, like it's party time, you know, but oh, they never my offered me. God. And then finally, oh. and finally, you know, they, then they, when they realized that I was more Jewish than them, you know, uh, then they offered me some coffee and and I refused. And they, and they were upset that I refused coffee from them, you know, because they were being so gentle. Yeah, that's the way it goes.
Yeah. Oh my. You've been poisoned by the Gentiles. That's what it is. You, you're, even though they're the ones that call them that follow Judeo Christianity, maybe that like uh, not only Judeo Christianity, a variant that was crafted by an atheist. Confusing world. I, I find Zionism fascinatingly destructive and just how ridiculously manufactured it is. It's yeah. goofier than Nazism. And Nazism yeah. had a guy called Heinrich Himmler who believed in ice giants living underneath the earth and that the earth was hollow. <laughs> and okay. Zionism still is goofier than that. Like, holy yeah. shit. Um, yeah. Especially if uh, you know you start like comparing it to relig the, the actual religious stuff they're referencing, <laughs> their yeah. own claims are just like not yeah. even there. You go uh, looking yeah, for them and you're like, yeah, yeah, they probably have never read the Torah. <laughs> like, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, like I had to translate the Torah, you know, from Hebrew to English for seven years in the in Talmud Torah school, like a madrasa, Islamic school. So, you know, I, I know what's in there. You know, what they claim is in there is not in there. You know, like it's not what it says they say. It's anyway. Yeah. Okay. Everyone's allowed their own opinion, you see. You got Linset liberalism oh, in the moment yes, when everyone is to, like clutch their pearls. Okay. Yeah. Freedom of expression, even though that's not what that means. <laughs> Oh my God, that's a thing we need to do a discussion point on at some point is uh, America's like poisoning of the importance of freedom of expression and how they kind of like oh, twist it up yeah. to mean like allowance to be like awful fucking people. Yeah, all of a sudden, you know, truth doesn't exist anymore. You know, like, <laughs> okay. You can just evaporate like reality itself as and when you please. Yeah, uh, Americans don't believe it, you know, but in Canada, you know, there's actually a clause in the in the criminal code uh, against hate speech, you know, so hate speech becomes like, you know, a, a threat. A threat is criminal speech because it's saying, you know, that uh, someone's going to be killed, you know, so that's considered to be real. And hate speech yeah. is considered to be real as well. But the United States, no, it's not. I don't even know, you know, if threats are considered to be illegal, you know, in the United States, according to the freedom of expression that they define but they don't know what they're we doing. We have there. hate speech laws here, but they're not that good. Oh yeah, they don't implement them, of course. You know, there's once this guy in this name, you know, German Nazi guy roaming around Toronto, you know, by the name of Zundel, who was uh, having oh, marches, you know, now. protesting against the uh, the definition of the Holocaust, saying the Holocaust hadn't happened. And he got a, you know, he got away with it, you know, for years and years. I had to grow up, you know, with all this happening around me, you know. I even saw one of his demonstrations, you know, totally freaked out. You know, I was going to throw a stone at the guy. But anyway. I mean, we had it with like um, that woman in uh, Scotland. Um, she was I think she was actually an English woman that traveled into Scotland because there was mm -hmm. a load of these turfs, trans exclusionary, radical, quote unquote, feminists. They're really conservatives that call themselves feminists. But anyway, uh, mm -hmm. she was she was like. Adolf Hitler told us about the big lie in Mein Kampf. That was her words exactly. And then she mm. goes on to say, the trans, uh, what's well, no gender ideology is the big lie. And like pointed mm. to like trans people as being the big lie. And like mm -hmm. that wasn't considered um, like, uh, like, you know, something that could be criminally charged for. And I'm like, that's well, incitement. She's really invoking That's incitement. Hitler. Like, if you were yeah, in Germany, and Hitler you were in an incitement Hitler. against trans people. That's incitement. That's illegal. That's criminal. You know, yeah, and, if, uh, it, you know it, it, just invoking Hitler, to be honest, is pretty yeah. fucking like, obviously, not if you're actually like talking about the history and stuff like that. But I mean, like, invoking him as in like quoting him as someone to be listening to. Like, yeah. in Germany, you'd be fucked, rightly so. Yeah. Like, yeah. you should be fucking done for. That's for that. what happened like, to Zindel after he was deported from Canada. He, he was sent to Germany, and Germany said, you know, like, fuck this, you know, this guy's going to prison. And he did for three years. And after that, you know, he had... Germany like, don't fuck around with that two stuff. Two supporters but actually left, they and kind that was that. Yeah, yeah. Germany Good. does okay. fuck around with that stuff, but... Uh, I could note to end up stuff. on, and uh, we uh, will be back next week. And this is the Convergence Forum, and... Uh, we are talking about what we can do and not what is done to us. It's a matter of what we're going to be doing otherwise.
because there's an alternative and we know what it is. Okay. So please share and uh, we'll be seeing you around. Bye for now. I'm sorry. For sure.